Well, thank you for that kind introduction. And I, it's a real honor to be here to give the Gutenberg Lecture this year. And I want to first uh, start out by acknowledging uh, my long-term collaborator, George Zant, who's worked with me for over 20 years in the Andes, as well as many of our current and former graduate students and colleagues that are shown uh, on this slide that have contributed to uh, a lot of these ideas. And we'll just get, uh, get started. So why study South America and the Andes? I probably don't have to tell this group, but there's a lot of reasons uh, that we might want to study it. One is that it, it's one of uh, the Earth's largest and long-lived ocean continent subduction zones, and it has some of the largest earthquakes, megathrust earthquakes that we know about, including the 1960 Chilean and the more recent 2010 Mall earthquake. Uh, it has a lot of a long strike and temporal variations in the slab geometry. It's got two classic flat slab regions, one in Peru and one in Chile and Argentina, that are still debated as to what causes flat slab subduction. Uh, it's an, uh, it has some of the largest um, volcanic fields, both volcanic arc and back arc ignimbrite volcanism, and it's a major convergent margin that has uh, a well-developed retroarc thrust belt that has a large amount of shortening uh, in some places up to 300 kilometers or more of shortening in, across the Andes where it's the widest. It's also the site of the Andean Plateau, one of the, the second largest plateau, continental plateaus on Earth, and it's usually defined by the three kilometer contour that you can see as the, uh, the black line. And it's a huge plateau with a, a width uh, of about 500 kilometers and over 10,000 kilometers along strike. So there's no shortage of different things to look at. The, the uh, challenge, I guess, is how do you get data to do this? And 20 years ago, there were a few permanent stations uh, in South America, but not a whole lot to, to work with, especially in terms of open data. So what I'm going to do today is talk about sort of four areas that I think we've made some progress in in imaging uh, the subduction zone and the convergent margin to give you an idea of the different scales that we're looking at and the different processes. And the first one I'll talk about the subducted Nazca slab and the tomography we've done that shows some of the, the variations in deformation, possible tears and folding, and some higher resolution images that, than we've ever seen on how the slab penetrates into the lower mantle. Uh, then I'll switch and talk a little bit about the flat slab segments and compare the Peru and Chile-Argentina flat slabs and some of the insights that we think that uh, we've, we've seen there. And I'll also then go to an area in southern Bolivia, the Altiplano Puna volcanic complex, and show work that we've done trying to image a magma body, so a whole different scale of imaging. And finally, I'll end with a little bit about uh, some of the ideas of piecemeal lithospheric removal along the Andes that uh, we're still working on and is a, a major topic of discussion among a lot of people. Well, how are we going to do all that? We're going to do it by combining um, a lot of seismic data that's been collected over the years in the Andes. And this slide shows uh, those white symbols are uh, mostly portable uh, broadband and short period deployments that have been done by a large number of groups. It represents about 600 stations. All of this data is open uh, and it's been collected by uh, a large group of people, not just us uh, at U of A, although I would say that our U of A group has been involved in about 250 of these individual station deployments. So. Uh, it's a big chunk, but by no means all of it. And I want to thank all of the groups in country, the international groups that have uh, collected a lot of this data and made it open. But by combining all this data, we can now begin to look at things along strike and look at it in a much more systematic way than we could by looking at just individual deployments with smaller apertures. Uh, of course, we still need more data, but yeah, I think we can... Um, we've made some good progress in, in looking at some of these things. And of course, this wouldn't have been possible for any of, of the U.S. investigators to do any of this if it weren't for the Iris Pascal Portable Program and the Iris Data Center with all the open data making it easy and, and accessible. So there's a lot of people to thank that made it possible to put all these uh, stations together. <clears throat> 
Well, if you haven't been to the Andes, or even if you had, this is sort of a reminder of one of the reasons why uh, it's a great place to work. It's absolutely spectacular. The Altiplano, which is the internally drained basin in the Andean Plateau, has big salars and is, is fairly easy to get around. But as you go to the west, there's high uh, stratovolcanoes that are active along parts of the margin. And as you go east, you get into the eastern cordillera that's a fold and thrust belt, but there's big uh, granodiorite intrusions that uh, form peaks that go up to six kilometers. Uh, so it's, it's a, a challenging place to work in many ways. And then when you drop off the plateau, you go into these beautiful Andean valleys. So that's just a quick look at, at some of the regions and a little bit of why uh, we find it uh, enjoyable to work there. But it's not without its challenges. Uh, many of you do seismic deployments. And first and foremost, we have to find people like this Bolivian family that would help us uh, watch a station and host a station in their backyard and make sure the security is all right. Sometimes we have to worry about getting our solar panels above the snow line. We know we can't get into the stations over the winter. Other times we have to deploy at 5,000 meters, which has its challenges. But, but overall, with all this equipment um, that works quite well, um, a lot of groups have gotten a lot of great data. Well, I'll just jump in now to some of the seismic imaging and things that we've done. And I'm going to start, as I said, with the teleseismic tomography images. This is work by Alyssa Charest in our group. And we've done finite frequency teleseismic tomography using the method of Schmatt and Humphreys by putting all this data together. And I'll remind you that these deployments were done over the last 20 years. Some are as short as four months, some are as long as two and a half years. So we've had to find common stations to, uh, that recorded common stations in the deployments and spatial overlap. But uh, of course, this has been possible. So this part of the, the project involves uh, 384 stations, broadband and short period, and uh, 546 earthquakes with uh, over 27,000 uh, P phases, both direct P and uh, core phases. And one of the important things about doing tomography in South America is making a good crustal correction because the crustal thickness varies from about 35 to 40 kilometers in some places to over 70 kilometers. So that can uh, influence your, your travel time residuals. Well, I'll start by showing some images. Uh, these show map slices of the P-wave tomography from uh, 200 kilometers down to about 410 kilometers. And you can see a nice high velocity uh, blue uh, anomaly. This, of course, is uh, velocity perturbations. It's plus or minus 4% is the scale. And um, down at 400 kilometers or so, you can see a fairly nice continuous slab anomaly, high velocity anomaly. As we come up in depth, uh, we see right in the oracline of the, the part of the Andes that bends. Uh, we see it really thickening, and it looks almost to us like it's starting to fold. And then as we go up even shallower, we can speculate a little bit that perhaps there's a small tear in there as the slab is trying to get around that corner. Uh, we image the slab pretty well up to about 150, maybe to 200 kilometers. Above that, I'll show you later, it gets to be, uh, it's a little bit variable depending on where you're at uh, along strike of the Andes. Well, I want to uh, show you some um, earthquake locations in this region. And no matter which earthquake global catalog you plot up, you see the nice uh, uh, plot of earthquakes as a function of depth. And I'll draw your attention to the green circles that are earthquakes between two and 300 kilometers in this range where we think there might be a tear. And again, you can see a very uh, noticeable pattern where the earthquakes sort of stop and there's a nice gap in here perhaps correlated with uh, this bend or, or perhaps tear in the, in the slab. The other thing I'd point out on here are the very deepest earthquakes, 500 to 600 or to 670 kilometers in blue and purple. And they're fairly well defined up here in the slab and down further south. But again, in this bend, they're a bit sparse. So the tomographic imaging gives us a good idea of what the geometry of the slab looks like where we don't have as many earthquakes. So this next slide shows um, deeper uh, map views of the uh, P-wave tomography, going from 455 down to 600 and 
five kilometers. And again, we see a fairly nice high velocity slab anomaly going through here. And north of the bend, it looks a little bit more thickened uh, perhaps than it does to the south, maybe a little more segmented, but again, we have to look at the resolution closely for that. Uh, and notice that at 715, once we've gone into the lower mantle, we still see a fairly well-defined slab, although again, it's, it's broader. So I want to show you some cross sections, but before I do, I just want to show you a slab recovery test to give you an idea of how well we can resolve things. So we've done these kinds of recovery tests in addition to checkerboard tests, and we construct a, um, a slab model using uh, Gavin Hayes' slab 1.0 model and create a synthetic data set, and then invert it with our particular geometry of events and stations. And uh, you can see the input and the output. And you can see that we recovered the slab reasonably well. Of course, this doesn't have noise, so it's an optimistic case. But even so, uh, we don't quite get the, 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 re the starting amplitude, but that's not unusual. And again, it's pretty well resolved up to 150 kilometers or so. Above that, it becomes a little more variable to recover the slab. And where the slab is flat or horizontal, of course, we can't, uh, we can't image it. So I'll show you some cross sections now. And, and I should say these go from uh, north of the Oracline in Peru down uh, through near the Oracline and then south. So here's three cross sections up in the northern part of, of the Andes, uh, north central in Peru. This is on the edge of where the slab is flat. So we don't expect to see that flat part. If you can see the yellow dots are earthquakes uh, so you can see the defined flat slab, and the solid line is slab 1.0. So what we see with our high-velocity anomaly is that the slab goes a little bit further inboard before it starts to uh, resubduct or sink into the mantle, and it does so at a very steep angle in this region. If you just look at these cross-sections going from north to south, you see that it's nearly vertical uh, in most cases, and in every case it goes a little bit further inboard. It also, in some cases, looks a little more folded, and you can see the anomaly as it penetrates through to the, uh, into the lower mantle. Well, now we'll go around the bin. I'll show one cross section, which is right uh, where we have some dense stations and just north of the oracline, and there's our slab model. It looks like as it penetrates through, it almost folds over on itself. Uh, then the next two are in the southern Altiplano and the northern Puna. And you can see the slab has a shallower dip. It fits quite nicely with the earthquakes. But they, of course, uh, stop at a, about 250 kilometers. And we see the slab going all the way down. This last cross section is right at the uh, change from a normal dip. You're starting to get into where the slab is flattening into the, the Chile Argentina slab. And uh, you can see the earthquakes are, are a lot flatter here. Slab dips down, and of course it intersects these deep earthquakes that are further, further south. Well, we can begin to make some surfaces of, of the slab that are shown here in blue. This is our high velocity slab anomaly. It show, it's, lo it's looking south, so this is north. It shows very nicely this little steep section of the, the slab right here that's right in line with where the Nazca Ridge is coming in, uh, shown offshore here. This dark black line is the um, conjugate, uh, the shape of the conjugate feature that is thought to perhaps have already uh, subducted in some fashion that formed on the, the Pacific side. You can also see a couple of things that I didn't point out in the map views, but we see some evidence that it's hard to make the slab go continuously through here, so there might be a small tear, question mark. And then we saw a big uh, red anomaly under the flat part of the slab that's behind here. But as you go south, you can see the slab has a more uh, normal dip. So now I want to focus in on this, uh, these two flat slab regions and show you a few things about them. Uh, here's a couple of maps. They're not plotted at the same scale. But both of these are sort of classic flat slab regions because of the, the ridges the, that are coming in. The Nazca Ridge uh, in Peru has a, a bathymetry of about 1.5 kilometers on the sea floor, and offshore work suggests it has oceanic crust of 18, maybe almost 20 kilometers thick. The other thing to notice up here is that 
Um, again, if you look at these green earthquakes that are at depth of 100 to 150, when you get into the flat slab, here's the 100 kilometer slab contour from slab 1.0, you see that there's really not that much seismicity. This is 20 years of ISC seismicity. It doesn't matter what catalog you look at, there's a big gap. In contrast, if you go to Chile uh, and, and Argentina, here's a Juan Fernandez ridge coming in. It's a series of seamounts. It's not quite as impressive. Offshore work shows variable crustal thickness, but in general, it's not that over thickened, maybe 10 kilometers or so from uh, places it's been I imaged. But when you get into the slab earthquakes, you see this huge uh, number of green earthquakes. This part of the slab is very, very seismogenic. These are contours from Anderson and others, but there's others that uh, it, it's not as well defined on this side uh, of it. But at any rate, right along the ridge, you can see all of these earthquakes. So there's some differences in these two uh, subduction, uh, flat slab subduction zones. So let me get into this and first talk about the Chile-Argentina one. We've, um, this is the classic uh, flat slab where we can see the red triangles are the volcano active arc. You can see that the arc shut off uh, where the slab comes in. And there were three different seismic deployments that were done, some of which overlapped that we've used uh, for the, the next few slides that I'm going to show you. And this is also the site of the basement cord uplifts that many of you have heard about. They're very similar to the Laramide basement cord uplifts, and that of these ranges you can see in the topography in here. So the idea is that, that there's been some thought that uh, the flat slabs would transmit stress and cause these basement cord uplifts to be pretty far inland from the actual trench. So we'll focus in on this region, and because there's so many earthquakes, I want to show you some uh, well-located earthquakes in this region. And here they are in map view, is the red dots. And if we look in cross sections right along the ridge, like this B line, you can see that the earthquakes with double difference locate into a nice thin zone of about 15 kilometers thick. If we look at other cross sections going off it in a different direction, we see the earthquakes drop off quite nicely. So it really defines the, the slab uh, down to a depth of about 200 kilometers. If we look across the ridge, we can see the earthquakes going across, uh, dipping off in each direction. And the region that's really flat is, is really not that wide. It's probably less than 200 kilometers. So it's not a, a huge uh, area that's, uh, that's really flat right up against the overriding lithosphere. Well, we've done a lot of uh, different receiver function images, and this shows one example of common conversion point stack receiver functions as, as a function of depth and distance across uh, the region. And here's the cross-section line. It's, it's just north of the actual ridge axis coming in right through there, so just on the north edge. But the slab is still pretty flat here. Um, and the, as many of you know, the receiver functions are uh, sensitive to discontinuities using P to S conversions, but don't tell us about absolute velocity. And we see the continental crust, Omoho, right through here. And then we see this blue and red arrival that we interpret as the top of the oceanic crust and the oceanic Moho. And it's quite strong until you get into this region where it disappears, and, and that perhaps could be where you get the basalt to eclogite transition, and then there's not a velocity contrast. So that looks pretty nice and continuous. So what happens if we go right up, up on the ridge? Well, if we go right to the ridge, uh, and this time we're, we're trying uh, some different processing, we're now migrating this instead of a constant crust and mantle velocity, as was in the other one, we're using ambient noise shear velocity model that we got uh, to account for any variations in the crust of the shear velocity. And again, you can see the continental moho coming all the way across. This is our cross-section line. Uh, but we don't see the slab quite as much. Maybe this uh, red arrival is the oceanic moho. It looks like it's offset, but it follows the earthquakes quite nicely. And one of the things that we've noticed is that if we actually look in detail uh, through our volume of receiver functions, going from off the ridge where we see a nice oceanic moho uh, to right on the ridge axis, we see it faulted or uh, displaced, and you can see as you go along, this red uh, gradually gets further and further offset. And when we look at this systematically, we see what looked like a series of trench parallel faults in the slab that uh, are most broken up right under where the ridge goes. So that suggests to us that, that the ridge is probably uh, 
very buoyant and contributing to, at least contributing to the flat slab and probably fairly strongly coupled to the overriding plate as the plate is trying to subduct its breaking up. Now I want to move to another issue uh, before I go to Peru, and that is the idea of hydration. We often uh, think of hyd the hydrating slab as uh, water coming off the, the slab as the, one of the sources for melt for volcanic arcs. So if you have a flat slab, you might expect that to be happening, and you'd hydrate the volume of mantle lithosphere that's above the flat slab. And this is something we've been working on for quite some time, and work we did with Laura Wagner suggested that at least if we used VPVS as a proxy, uh, VPVS was pretty low and, and wasn't, uh, it didn't look like it was that hydrated. Well, we've continued to work on this, this problem, and this image I'm showing up here is a local tomography image using um, the local earthquakes done by Linkamer 2011 and you can see that there were good earthquakes to use both in the, the slab and the crust and this is VPVS you can see the scale here and what we see above the slab is a region of blue or very low VPVS and then as you go further east it looks a little more normal but it doesn't really look like the high VPVS ratios that we sort of were expecting for hydrated uh, material. So one thing we can conclude from this is that either the overriding uh, mantle lithosphere is not, the large volume of it is not hydrated and perhaps the fluids have much more local pathways to get through it or they're being trapped here until you resubduct or uh, the, the way we understand petrology doesn't work. Uh, I think this will be a, a continuing area of, of research to try to understand what's happening. Um, another way we can look at this is with surface waves. So this is a cross-section, again, right along the ridge, uh, done by Ryan Porter, using ambient noise and ballistic surface waves with the two-plane wave method, uh, and then inverting for shear velocity. And the thing that Ryan saw, again, was that there's pretty high shear velocities above the flat slab, and it's not until the slab starts to dip down that you see a region of lower shear wave velocities, perhaps where some of the, the water is being released. Okay, I want to move to the uh, Peru flat slab, which has some similarities but some differences. I've already uh, mentioned the lack of earthquakes compared to Argentina. And here's the Nazca Ridge coming in, and here's the projection of the conjugate feature from the Western Pacific that might, uh, the Nazca Ridge might have looked something like this, although maybe not exactly, that's been subducted in pretty, pretty far. So again, we've looked at a lot of receiver functions and made a volume using uh, several different deployments that have been done in this region. And there's a lot of, uh, there were a lot of posters today showing a lot of these results. This is work by Bishop, and these are different receiver function cross-sections, and they're pretty complicated. They're a lot more complicated than Argentina. So let me point out a couple of things. Let's start with the line to the north, and you can see what we're interpreting as the moho coming through here, and then below that we see a nice uh, signal that we think is the oceanic uh, moho that's at about 100 kilometers. So that looks pretty good until we go west, and the slab is coming in, and it hit, it looks like it comes in right to here, and what we see is a very nice offset or break in the slab. So again, it looks like the slab is breaking, and as far as we can tell, it looks like along the trend of it is sub, uh, parallel to the, the trench. But it gets even more uh, interesting or complicated as we move down to cross-section B and C, which is right where the Nazca Ridge is coming in. So again, we think that perhaps we can see the continental crust uh, coming in here. It's getting a bit thin if this is the continental crust along the B cross section, maybe closer to 55 kilometers thick. Uh, and we think this is the oceanic moho again, but see how close they are. The slab looks like it's right up against the base of the crust or very close to it. Uh, and as you go to see the same thing, here's the moho, and here's where we think we're seeing the oceanic, uh, the oceanic moho. The black dots, although I know they're a little bit hard to see, these are relocated earthquakes by Kumar et al. Uh, and they're, they're quite well, well located. And the fact that there aren't that many of them is because in the, the two or two and a half year period, there just were not that many small earthquakes. So that global pattern really holds up. 
Now, if we look D to D prime, this is not ideal because we have some gaps in our stations. But again, we see what we think is the oceanic moho, very shallow right here where the ridge comes in. The ridge comes in at zero and then dips down uh, in this direction. And as we go here, dips down again in uh, the D, D prime uh, direction to the south. So you can see that we think we're seeing the slab really raised up at where the Nazca Ridge comes in. Um, so despite the, these complicated receiver functions, we can follow these surfaces throughout the volume. Uh, well, what we've tried to do then is, to make it a little bit simpler to look at, we've taken the, the slab contours from the teleseismic tomography as the red solid lines. Here's where we think there's maybe a little tear, and here's where there's the tear in the slab from the receiver functions. And where we have stations, we've just picked the depth to the oceanic slab and contoured it in a kind of a general way. And you can see that right there is the 70 kilometer uh, contour and the 80. So it really looks like the slab is coming in at a very, very shallow depth here. And of course, along the coast, there's a lot of evidence of coastal uplift associated with the Nazca slab subduction. So where the ridge comes in, again, it really looks like uh, it's coupled uh, very strongly to the overriding crust and contributing to the buoyancy, at least, of the uh, flat slab region here. Well, one more thing, I want to show you crustal thicknesses, and just to put it in perspective, I'm going to show you a receiver function line by Jamie Ryan that's off the flat slab, well off the flat slab, uh, across uh, one of the wider parts of the Andes. And we see a nice continental moho dipping down uh, from about 40 kilometers onto the high elevations to somewhere near uh, 70 kilometers. And this is all important because uh, remember I said that uh, in many ways we had to make crustal corrections. Here's our map of crustal thickness based on the receiver functions at where we have data and where we don't have data. We've smoothly made it connect in with Tassar's model for uh, the depth to Moho based on the gravity data. So that's particularly important in the, in the fore arc and certainly out in here. You can see the very thick crust under the high elevations of the northern Altiplano that's not unexpected, nearly 70 kilometers by Lake Titicaca. And as we go north, it's, we find this region uh, right in here where the, sla where the ocean, continental moho seem to thin to 50, 55 kilometers even, and then gets a little bit thicker out here. Uh, so this was somewhat surprising, and if, if we've uh, identified that continental moho correctly, which we think we have, this correlation with the subducting ridge uh, present day is, is quite intriguing and suggests that there's some process that's not only uh, modifying or perhaps even removing the, the mantle lithosphere, but it's also modifying the crust in some way. So I'll just quickly summarize the flat slab areas. And I think um, in both places, we're seeing where these ridges subduct. The, the subducted flat slab is faulting and breaking up. It's not just smoothly going down. It looks like it's contributing to the buoyancy and is really strongly coupled to the overriding plate. So at least we think that the, sla the ridges are uh, one of the things that are adding to the, the buoyancy of the slab and the, the geometry of the slab. It's not to say there aren't other factors, many of them which we've heard about today in the session on flat slab, but this is certainly one that contributes to it. And perhaps the differences between these two have to do with how these ridges were formed at hot spots and their different um, buoyancies. Well, I want to move on now to some magmatic processes. Uh, work that we've done. And of course, as I mentioned, there's, a, there's an active volcanic arc shown by the red triangles, and there's associated back arc volcanism as well. And I want to point out the Altiplano Puna volcanic complex that's right here. It's a very large silicic magmatic field that, or volcanic field that has a lot of ignimbrites. Uh, and there's been a number of deployments in that region that has allowed us to look at this in, in more detail. And one of the other things that I'll just briefly mention is can we say anything about whether there's a batholith forming under the active arc? So I'll jump into the ambient noise tomography work that Kevin Ward has done. And again, taking all of these broadband stations, 
and cross-correlating things with those stations that were out at the same time, you can see that there's quite a few paths despite the 20-year period of the different deployments that were going on. And uh, we've processed it, uh, first determining the phase velocity maps and then inverting for shear velocity over this large region so we can look at it in a systematic way. And I'm showing here some of those map slices from uh, Ward et al. Uh, 5 kilometers, 15 kilometers, and 30 kilometers depth slices. And you can see a number of things, some of which you'd expect at the very shallow depths. You see the Altiplano Basin and the Subandean Zone uh, as low velocities. And you see the um, Eastern Cordillera high peaks right through here as those granodiorite peaks that I showed in the, the slides earlier. Uh, those are, have high Veloc shear velocities. I'll just point out all the way through here, here's the Altapana Puna volcanic complex. It has the slowest shear velocities all the way through the crust. Here's another big ignimbrite field, the Los Frailes ignimbrite field that's also slow. So these uh, big ignimbrite fields, at least some of them are showing up as, as having very low shear wave velocities. And then we see fairly high shear wave velocities in the mid to lower crust of the Sierras Pompeianus region where the slab is flat uh, that we might expect. So I want to zoom in on this Aldeplano Puna volcanic complex. It has ages that range from 10 to uh, 1 million years. And here's a blow up of that region uh, showing seismic stations of the little squares. Probably can't see those. Uh, <clears throat> this black line is showing the outline of the volcanic complex. And inside the white line is showing, um, is centered on one of the volcanoes that shows some surface uh, inflation that's currently going on. So keep in mind this outline, and I'll show you cross sections B and C going through here of um, some of the shear wave uh, velocities. But because we really wanted to look in more detail than just with ambient noise, Kevin did a joint inversion with. Uh, receiver functions that are sensitive to discontinuities and ambient noise that's sensitive to the absolute velocities. And you saw that you can really see the signature of this low velocity zone in both the receiver functions and in the dispersion. But by putting them together in a joint inversion, these top row shows cross section B and cross section C going through uh, across uh, this volcanic field. And compare that to the ambient noise uh, models below that where we've just used ambient noise and you can see how much sharper the uh, uh, images of that low velocity zone. So what does that low velocity zone uh, mean? Well, we'll first look at some map slices through that uh, joint inversion shear wave velocity model and notice the outline of the surface volcanics uh, are also shown on here and you can really see this very low velocities that get down well below uh, 2.5 kilometers per second all the way down to around 2 kilometers per second, which is extremely slow for that depth in the crust. Uh, so you can see it strongly at 10, 15 kilometers, and you're starting to lose it at 20. We've defined uh, the 2.9 kilometer per second contour as sort of the zone, a conservative estimate of the zone of, of low velocities at, the, at that uh, velocity for these kinds of uh, solicit compositions, it would imply that there's got to be some partial melt. So when you do that, you s see that it's about 200 kilometers in diameter, about 11 kilometers thick, and the correlation with the surface volcanics is pretty strong, suggesting that we're probably seeing the plutonic complex that's associated with those surface volcanics. And if you take that volume that we've outlined, what, that we think is pretty conservative, it's about 500,000 cubic kilometers. So this is, is quite large. And finally, this is a three-dimensional uh, view of it in the crust. Um, if we, we've termed this and so have others, the Altiplano Puna magma body, it's some sort of mush zone with partial melt. If we make some assumptions, it looks in especially with composition, it looks like it might have between uh, 20 and 25% uh, partial melt. So the other thing that we can speculate on is a intrusive uh, uh, a ratio, uh, the extrusive to intrusive ratio, and it looks like based on this volume and estimates of the surface volcanics that it's about 1 to 25 or 30, 
which if you follow that is much higher than many of the, the petrologists have suggested over the years. So this is an example I think where again putting all the, the deployments together and having data over a localized area we can begin to uh, image things much better than we have in the past in the, in the crust. And finally, uh, this idea of whether we're ha forming a batholith under the uh, active arc is still an active area of research, if you will. But one of the things we, I just want to point out is here's the active arc going along here, and here's the average crustal shear velocity model. Here's the Altiplano Puna volcanic complex. Here's the anomaly for the Los Frailes. But you can see this zone of low velocities here, which is on the edge of the arc. And although we still have a lot more work to do on this, there are some intriguing hints that there is perhaps a battle of forming today under the arc. Okay, I'd like to move on now to the, the last topic that I want to uh, mention, and that is lithospheric removal. Uh, that's a, a, been a popular topic for a long time, and we've all been looking for that smoking gun, and um, there's a lot of papers written on it. And I just want to start by saying that there's at least two causes of lithospheric removal, uh, or remind you, and one is based on magmatic processes. Um, during batholith formation, you produce a dense eclogitic root, and that leads to an instability. And so there's a lot of work showing, uh, especially in modeling, that this could happen. And the other way that you could produce lithospheric removal uh, is by tectonic shortening. And when you shorten the crust, it pushes crust deeper and lower. And particularly if you have uh, a mafic component to the lower crust, it would lead, again, to an instability um, that could lead to uh, lithospheric removal. And in a place like the Andes, I think we have to consider both because we have uh, of course, the active arc and potential batholith formation, but we also have a lot of tectonic shortening in the back arc. So we'll go back to our teleseismic um, P wave uh, tomography and and look at that and see what we can say. Now, with all of these deployments, most m most people that collected that data did a lot of nice individual studies of tomography, local tomography, to look at the the wedge. Uh, and they saw a lot of heterogeneity in the upper mantle, just like we do. But it's hard to link those studies together because they've been done different ways and they don't cover quite enough of the wedge to really get a, a picture. But on the other hand, I'll show you there's some limitations to looking at this. So 95 kilometers depth is uh, as, as shallow as we think we have good resolution in the Andes. And when you look at this, it's really uh, very heterogeneous. You see some blue things that, that might be drips hanging down. You see some red areas that might be places where you've already removed things in the past. And probably this process has been going on for a long time in the Andes over multiple cycles. And we don't always image the slab all that well at this depth. So it becomes a little more uh, complicated. But I want to just for a few moments talk about whether any of these anomalies here outlined in, in yellow, these blue high velocity anomalies in the back arc might uh, be consistent with some idea of, of lithospheric removal. So I'll first show you um, a comparison of those uh, blue anomalies with our ambient noise map slice at 15 kilometers and where some of the really big low velocity zones are. And I talked about the Altiplano Puna volcanic complex. Here's uh, some more low velocities in the crust. And there is some correlation with uh, lithospheric removal and volcanics in, in the Puna. And of course, there's been a lot of work done on that it was early on, starting with K and K, looking at uh, the signature of lithospheric removal through the geochemistry. So I think the picture is emerging that in the Puna, there's uh, been a lot of removal. As we go north, there's regions uh, along here that you might think are still some mantle lithosphere, either attached or dripping off, uh, but they're not associated with the, the active arc or they're not associated with any active back arc volcanism in a big way, but they are where we see a lot of crustal shortening, some of the maximum crustal shortening there. So let's look at this in just a little more detail. Uh, if we go back to our slab model, just to put it into context, here's our, our slab, here's our steep part of the slab, uh, this green is sort of linking up a lot of those little blue areas that dip down to about 150 kilometers. And then this uh, lighter blue is, a, is a, one of those uh, 
potential drips that was a high velocity anomaly. And they're situated uh, near the edge of the Eastern Cordillera subandean boundary or maybe even a little bit further east. So they're a little further east than we might think if something was just dripping straight off, but of course we know that it's unlikely things are going to just go vertically in this kind of a complex setting. So we can blow this up and look at one of these cross sections uh, near the, the auric line. Here's our earthquakes coming down on our slab and here's these two regions that we might uh, speculate could be mantle drips in the back arc. And they're beginning to look a lot like some of the thermomechanical modeling that shows as you thicken crust, you begin to get these things to drip off, and they may be dripping off uh, a little bit toward the east. So I think we're starting to, with a little more work, get some models that we can now start to compare in more detail to some of the thermomechanical models. Well, we want to investigate this a little bit further. So we've picked one of the, the really nicely well-defined uh, high-velocity back arc anomalies in the Puna, where we know that this process has been going on. And so we'll look at, at uh, some data from this region. Again, here's all the different uh, seismic deployments that have been done in the region. It's getting to be fairly well studied with um, deployments. In order to really evaluate this, um, Anomaly A, I'm now showing you the inversion with the slab constraint so we can make sure that we're accounting for the slab fully at these shallow depths. But you see the same anomaly whether you constrain the slab or not. Uh, and it's this anomaly A that we see sitting back here. It's not part of the slab. So what is it? Well, I'm going to show you a series of cross sections at 22 degrees south, 25, and about 27 and a half because I think we there's some value in looking at this in a, long, in, a, in a long strike way. And what we've done at these cross sections now is to take the P wave tomography results and for the crust we've put in the um, ambient noise shear wave velocity tomography. So we have shear wave sitting on top of P wave. Not ideal, but that's what we have. So we can uh, look at both. And then the top panel is the topographic profiles. So if we look at the 22 degrees south, this is near the uh, big low velocity zone, the uh, Altiplano Puna magma body, very slow crust. We get the slab. And in the, the uh, back arc, the mantle wedge, the velocities are fairly low. The reds are a little bit of blue, but really nothing stands out. So it looks like it's probably already been uh, had lithosphere removed. But as we come south, we see this big anomaly A right here and we see the red next to it. it, it looks as though maybe we've removed this, replaced it with a phenosphere, uh, and it's dropping off into the mantle uh, to the east. If we look at the crust, we also see low velocities in the crust, which would be consistent with bringing lithosphere close to the base of the crust and adding some heat. And finally, as we go to the southern cross section, this is right at the edge of the northern Sierras Pompeianus. The slab hasn't quite gone flat, but it's getting shallower. We see high P wave velocities, and we see fairly high lower crustal velocities, suggesting that there's still lithosphere there, and it hasn't been removed. Uh, another interesting correlation is if we look at the tropographic profiles. Uh, if we look at the profile through the southern one, it's this black line. We still have the high arc, but the back arc average elevation is about two kilometers. You can see that individual peaks are higher that are part of the Sierras, starting the Sierras Pompeianus ranges, but overall the back arc is fairly low. Uh, the two cross sections at 25 and 22 degrees in red and blue, uh, the back arc is very high, is four, four kilometers or more. Um, and it's quite striking to us that this change in elevation along strike correlates so well with the lithospheric structure. Of course, we can't be sure it's the only thing contributing to the change in elevation, but it's certainly an interesting uh, correlation. Well, I'll just wrap up here, and um, I've tried to show you uh, a few of the kinds of things that we're able to work on and image in the Andes when we put together all this seismic data from over 600 stations that's been collected uh, essentially one hole at a time, if you will. Um, and although as much as we've done, I think there's still a, a tremendous amount more to do.
And uh, it's exciting time because there's an addition of many new high quality permanent stations going in with regional networks right now that are just being installed. And all of this will, I think, uh, help transform our, our seismic imaging even more. It's also time, um, as I'm sure many of you know, for a new generation of portable uh, seismic instrumentation so that we can deploy uh, more, better, faster, lighter, low power, all those things that we talk about. And finally, I'll just end with the thought that uh, as we think about the next uh, community-driven large-scale project, South America might be a great place for a, a large internationally coordinated uh, project such as a subduction zone observatory. And finally, I just want to acknowledge um, the funding sources and all the uh, data centers and field crews from all these places that have made collecting this data possible, and all the many people that have been involved in um, uh, discussions and work on the Andes that's helped our group tremendously. Thank you. So thank you, Susan, for a wonderful talk, and we have time for questions now. I would ask that if you do have a question, there's a microphone there and a microphone there, so please come up there so, so we can hear you. So questions? Okay. Hello, thanks for your talk. Uh, are there any attenuation measurements on that Altiplano Puma, Puna magma body? Thank you. Uh, yeah, there are some attenuation studies uh, that have been done with the, the local um, <clears throat> deployments, and there's some on the Puna by um, some of the groups from the Geosed Potsdam group, I believe, that have done uh, attenuation in the Puna. There's less attenuation done in the Altiplano. Uh, there's some attenuation being done in uh, southern uh, Peru right now. But it's definitely an area that needs more work done. Other questions? So I have a, a, a question. So the, the very large low velocity anomaly that, that you're seeing below the slab, sort of that relative to, um, for example, the role of the thickened crust in the down going plate. I mean, have you sort of evaluated the, the competing um, roles of that in, in producing the flat slab subduction? Uh, we, haven't evaluate, we haven't looked at that in as much detail as we need to. One of the things I didn't have time to go into is we see that, that very low velocity anomaly under the proof flat slab. We also think in the receiver functions we may see a hint of the LAB above that. And if so, it's, it's pretty shallow. It suggests that the oceanic lithosphere is thinner than we'd expect from the overall age. But if you think about it being formed as a hot spot and maybe being reset, maybe that's not so unusual. Um, in answer to the more general question, I think there is evidence in both flat slabs that the um, slab mantle lithosphere is probably hydrated and, and contributing to some of the buoyancy. And it's not just the ridge and the crust, but it's a fascinating area. Yeah, I, I was uh, struck by the uh, sort of intense seismicity that you showed under the, uh, I, I think within the slab, mm -hmm. uh, under the flat, one of the flat parts, I forget which one. So does that have some sort of implication for the mechanism of intermediate depth earthquakes? Because usually, I mean, they're competing mechanisms, dehydration and brittlement, uh, shear runaway. Um, has any work been done on that area in regard to earthquake mechanisms? Um, not as much that could be done. This is the Chile-Argentina flat slab area, and there have been focal mechanisms done on those earthquakes, and they tend to show um, down dip tension, but going off in all directions, you know, as if the slab's being pulled down. Um, but in terms of the details relating it to dehydration reactions and things, not enough work, that's for sure. It always struck us from the literature that there should be, if, if if much of the literature is right, all these earthquakes should be telling us that there's a lot of dehydration going on, and so there should be a fair amount of water coming off that slab. So we went into it thinking it's the perfect place to see hydrated uh, mantle lithosphere. 
above it. And of course, over multiple years, we haven't been able to find that, at least as defined by high VPVS ratios. Uh, so I think it's quite an interesting place to study that in more detail, why that seismicity rate is so high, and particularly in contrast to Peru, where it seems so low. Question here? Ooh. Oh, over there. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Just quickly, you didn't speak about it, but I'm just wondering if you've, uh, what sort of new insights you've gained on the western extent of the Brazilian craton that's being thrust under the sub-Andes, and in particular, its geometry sort of from north to south, like as you move from Bolivia into Argentina. Yeah, so I was hoping no one would ask that question. Because <laughs> in some early papers, we thought we were seeing the edge of it, you know, th under thrusting uh, to the edge of the eastern Cordillera, certainly under the sub-Andean zone. And I still think something's under thrusting, but we really haven't seen very well uh, that high velocity lithosphere coming in. And I think, you know, we can him and haw a little bit and say, well, we don't have enough stations far enough east to really see it, but we are seeing what looks like fairly thin lithosphere coming in, at least in the central part of the Andes. And when uh, you look at the, the tomography done further east in Brazil, they, see, they don't see a nice uh, smooth base of the lithosphere. They see it very irregular uh, with a relic plume. And so perhaps our simple thinking of some nice thick lithosphere coming in is wrong. But we do have plans to combine this data with data in Brazil to try to look at that in a little more detail. Thank you.